and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Ratchleff as our keynote speaker for this session. So I met Peter on a very cold day in October 2018. I was on a fascinating restorative justice tour of St Paul and Peter was our tour guide. I was immediately impressed by Peter's breadth and depth of knowledge and I learned a great deal that day. And much of the tour was outside. And as I was very cold indeed, which is hard to imagine now, <laughs> I was extremely relieved when we reached the Eastside Freedom Library. And when we went indoors, I was delighted, but not only because I warmed my fingers and toes, but also because the library was such a wonderful, welcoming place and it warmed my heart and my soul. And I have many fond memories of the Eastside Freedom Library. And here's one of the photographs I took that day. So it's a great pleasure that I welcome Peter to speak to us now. Helen, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it's such a delight to see you again uh, and to know that something we did has opened additional doors. Um, and I'm honored uh, to have been invited and to have the opportunity uh, to talk with people as I'm seeing from all over the world. Um, you know, we're probably all in a position now of trying to figure out what have we learned during the pandemic that we want to continue to do rather than return to something that unfortunately is called normal. And Zoom has provided us with the ability to have conversations with each other in real time, uh, which is something we do not want to lose here at the Eastside Freedom Library in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, and something that we want to figure out how to make more interactive and how to build on. Um, even as we try to progress beyond uh, this crisis that, that we are in. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I'm also gonna be part of the closing panel. So I hope that we get to do some uh, questions and conversation. And I certainly want to be available to you uh, via email, uh, via Zoom. Um, I encourage you to look at our website, uh, www.eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, and uh, you can reach me at Peter at eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. So nothing suspicious, nothing tricky about any of those forms of communication. Um, we are uh, this month celebrating our eighth anniversary uh, as an organization and an institution. Um, I am uh, a labor historian uh, by training and trade. Um, I came into the field of labor history in the 1970s at a time when the field was being, as we said at the time, undergoing a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift was from focusing on uh, unions as the heart of labor history and economics uh, and collective bargaining as a way of focusing uh, on unions uh, to shifting to a social history of working people uh, as the purview of, of labor history. And this meant that I became very interested in both immigration history and African-American history. And the Eastside Freedom Library really shows those uh, focal points, shows sort of tries to situate ourselves at intersections intersections between immigrants and the labor movement, intersections between workers of color and white workers, uh, intersections between education and entertainment um, as ways of bringing people together and bringing stories, experiences, and perspectives that have been marginalized uh, pushed to the shadows and the corners to bringing them into the center uh, of our awareness and interest. So we're located in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota's 
most diverse and most economically challenged uh, neighborhood. Um, we are very much uh, carrying the consequences of uh, neoliberal globalization. Uh, this is an area that, of course, like most of the United States, uh, was once indigenous land. Uh, here, the predominant community was Dakota, and there were seven distinct communities of Dakota people. Uh, they were ethnically cleansed, uh, driven out in the 1830s, 1840s, leading to a war uh, between the United States and the Dakota people during the American Civil War um, in the early 1860s. And this land was then made available for European settlers. Um, as a recovering academic, I will just mention parenthetically that um, my way of thinking has been rattled and sort of knocked apart and put back together uh, by my recent reading of Mahmoud Mamdani's uh, Neither Native Nor Settler. Uh, I cannot recommend any book as much as I would recommend Professor Mamdani's book. Uh, and we have tried to come to grips at the Eastside Freedom Library with the layers of history here, beginning with the Dakota people who are not only part of our past, but are also part of our present. People from that community are still here. And as we engage more deeply with them, we also understand the ways that they are part of our future, that their understanding of ways of engaging with uh, the environment, uh, their ways of um, dealing with issues of gender and gender uh, variety, non-normativity, um, are all things that we can learn a great deal from. Beginning in the 1840s, uh, immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, particularly Sweden, Germany, and Ireland, uh, began to settle in this part of St. Paul. Um, they then became the base for a workforce for blue collar manufacturing. And, uh, and building railroads and transportation. Uh, we are situated on the Mississippi River uh, and transportation has been a very important part uh, of the development of the St. Paul economy. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, immigrants from Southern, Central and Eastern Europe would arrive, particularly Italians, Serbs, Slovenes, um, and then in the era of World War I, immigrants from Mexico. Uh, and uh, they became part of a cohesive working class in this part of St. Paul that was utterly uh, torn apart by global neoliberalism. Uh, we lost over 15,000 unionized blue collar jobs in the 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, many European descended or so-called white people uh, moved away, property values plummeted, uh, uh, government interest in this part of the city declined. Um, and this, those same macroeconomic forces were transforming the lives of people in Southeast Asia, East Africa, and Central America, pushing them to emigrate. Many of them came here. Um, so in an area that was once almost 100% European descended, where now more than 40% Asian and Asian American, predominantly Hmong and Karen, um, there is a large East African uh, actually set of East African communities, uh, Eritrean, Oromo, Amhara, Somali, uh, and there is a growing Central American community, both Mexican and Salvadoran. So we live, my partner Beth Cleary, who was a theater professor and theater maker, 
Uh, Beth and I live in this neighborhood and uh, we experienced these changes and realized that uh, the newcomers were not being welcomed uh, by the European descended people who had lived here for generations. Um, and the deeper we dug, the more we realized that many of the newcomers were also uh, living in silos and not interacting much with each other. And so we wanted to create a space where people would share their stories with each other, where they would feel safe uh, to tell their stories. Um, because of Beth's work in theater and the arts, uh, we really felt that there were many ways uh, that people might tell their stories. So there could be poetry, music, dance, theater, visual art, music. Um, and we wanted to create a space where all of those means uh, could be leveraged by our neighbors, um, that we with some experience, or as we say in the US, uh, with some white privilege, uh, that we knew how to navigate uh, the nonprofit world, uh, the foundation world, we thought we knew how to navigate the political world. Um, obviously, things have been more complicated than we had imagined, um, but that we've committed ourselves to leveraging the resources to make it possible for our neighbors to share their stories with each other in the hopes that they would find empathy and ultimately solidarity leading to organization and action. So we had noticed over our years in the American Academy that uh, when professors retire, uh, they face quite a crisis. I should say we face quite a crisis about what to do with our books and materials. Um, I use the metaphor of um, professors leaving piles of books outside the the door of the office they are abandoning for students to pick through like bones in the desert. Um, and we wanted to offer our former colleagues and, and friends, not only at McAllister College where we had taught, um, but really across the country and even across the world. I just got several boxes of books from an old friend who teaches in Wales, um, that we wanted to provide a new home uh, for those books. We wanted to shelve those books in a slightly unconventional way. Uh, that is, we wanted to shelve them in the collections as they were donated, um, because we believe that books that have been written in, full of marginal comments and underlinings, are even more valuable than brand new books, and that it's helpful to people who might use them to know who was the person who wrote, this guy needs to read more Marx, or this is really bullshit uh, in the margins of books and, and to understand who had engaged those books those ways. We also wanted to encourage people who might use the books to think about how someone had developed their thinking over the course of a lifetime as manifested in the books that they had collected. So in eight years, we have now cataloged and shelved 27,000 books, um, mostly focused in immigration, labor, racial justice, gender justice, critical thinking about popular culture, um, and quite a number of books that are expressions of those issues in fiction, poetry, theater, visual art, memoir, uh, oral history and beyond. We then launched uh, right from our start in 2014, uh, a pretty aggressive programming uh, strategy that we would invite authors uh, who had new books uh, to shake down their publishers and to get the publishers to send us three or four complimentary copies of the books that we could hand out uh, to people that we had relationships with, for them to read and engage in public conversation with the authors. Um, I urge you 
uh, when you visit our website, uh, go to the header that says media, and under media, you will find the YouTube uh, heading. Um, many of our programs are archived, videoed, and archived on the YouTube page. Um, and you can see how this process of engaging authors in conversation as a way to open the door for wider conversation with audiences, um, how we've been doing that. So many of the issues that propelled us uh, to initiate the Eastside Freedom Library uh, were re-emphasized and exacerbated by the pandemic um, and the murder of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis, which is the city right across the river. Um, and we've really realized that, that we were doing, the, we were on the right track, that um, inequity in wealth, in power, in public voice, uh, refracted through racism and xenophobia, uh, were laid bare by the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, uh, and the racial justice uprising that swept the Twin Cities, the country, and much of the world, that we're on the right track. We also know how far we have to go. Um, and the pandemic particularly um, challenged us to figure out how to do what we were doing, sadly, without convening people in person. Um, although we have discovered in the last two years that our front lawn is a wonderful place to have programs. Uh, we've had the sort of interesting learning curve um, that because we're in a beautiful historic Carnegie Library building with thick brick and stone walls, that we've had to get ethernet cables uh, in order to have wireless access out on the front lawn. Uh, the walls interfere with the Wi-Fi. Um, but we've been doing more and more programming on the lawn, uh, whether it is conversations with authors, poetry readings, theatrical performances, debates with city council and school board members. Um, we've been trying to do more and more of it uh, in person. Um, we're also trying to learn how to use hybrid forms so that we can have an in-person experience, but also involve people in other places. Before the pandemic, um, we were doing a lot of work uh, with our diverse Ethiopian neighbors. We were approached by a group of Amharic poets who were looking for a place to have poetry readings where alcohol was not going to be served. Um, and we began to video their readings and live stream them by Facebook um, and then later live stream them by Zoom uh, to people in uh, the Horn of Africa. And we had some poetry events that we realized up to 20,000 people were watching um, in East Africa. And, and so we were already beginning to discover uh, what Zoom and the internet were making possible uh, for us. So I wanna mention on um, just a couple of things that, uh, that we've been doing um, to give you an idea of the range uh, of activities. Um, we've been working on the issue of housing justice. Um, many of our neighbors struggle uh, to afford uh, appropriate housing. Uh, many of our immigrant neighbors have multi-generational families with large numbers of children um, and struggle to find living space that's adequate. Um, we are experiencing the long-term consequences of racism in access to housing. Um, here in Minnesota, there's been a very good research project called Mapping Prejudice, which looks at something called restrictive covenants 
that much property in the early to mid 20th century came with deeds that forbid the owners from selling those properties to people of color, to Asians, to Jews. Uh, and uh, there's been a great deal of research and learning about that history and the consequences. For instance, even maps that overlay where there were exclusive neighborhoods and which neighborhoods today have adequate numbers of trees and which neighborhoods don't. And so we're, we're learning these long-term consequences and trying to bring our neighbors together to develop their self-confidence, to give them information about resources and how programs work, and encourage them to organize together um, to speak in a loud voice to city, state, and federal government, to developers and banks. So the housing justice work has been very important for us. Um, at the same time, we do things like make space available on a weekly basis to older Karen women who weave, and we're looking for a space to weave for the last four years, even during COVID, uh, wearing masks. Uh, these women have been coming to the library and weaving cloth, and, and I would say quite literally weaving community uh, while they're at it. They've been teaching uh, teenagers, uh, mostly girls, but a few boys, um, how to become weavers uh, as well. And they've become kind of folk heroes within their own community. And, um, and we have uh, events on the lawn where they sell the cloth that they've woven and um, more and more people are appreciating uh, the work of these Karen women. They're increasingly in conversation with Hmong women who, who have maintained an art form um, called Pandao or story cloths, ways of telling their history through sewing. Um, and it's so exciting to see these women from different communities coming together, teaching each other their crafts and talking about the histories um, that they're expressing in, in the work that they're doing. Um, we organize an annual uh, union job fair um, to encourage immigrants, uh, not just to seek jobs in unionized settings, but also to engage in conversation with the representatives of unions to learn what difference it makes if the nursing home that they work in or the hospital that they work in or the factory that they work in um, is unionized uh, as, as opposed to uh, non-union. It's also a way for us to encourage our friends in the labor movement to work harder to bring more diverse people into their workplaces and into their organizations. Um, we've been focusing since the murder of George Floyd, uh, focusing on building solidarity between our African, African-American and Asian-American neighbors, um, the way that racism and xenophobia have worked in the United States has tended to pit them against each other, uh, scrambling for what are overall inadequate resources, um, and instead to encourage them uh, to work together um, and, and to fight for a larger share of resources uh, from the society as a whole. Uh, we're working in uh, two projects in curriculum development. Uh, one is to uh, change what elementary school teachers are using to teach Minnesota history, to take the stories of indigenous people, particularly the Dakota, uh, and to bring their stories into the center of the narrative of Minnesota history. And we're working with a number of organizations in developing elementary school curriculum. And the deeper we get into the project, the more we're also wrestling with the need to reconsider the pedagogy that's used to teach such curriculum in elementary schools. 
We're continuing to learn. We're also working with a committee in the St. Paul Public Schools to develop a 10th grade course in critical ethnic studies that beginning in September will be mandatory for all high school students uh, in the city of St. Paul. Um, and we're working on what should be incorporated in that curriculum, um, which then also brings me to uh, where Helen started us, uh, mentioning her experience on the walking tour. Um, I have been leading walking tours and, and I would say, you know, inspired by what I experienced in New York City, uh, where there is a what I think one of the most important museums in the country, uh, the Lower East Side Immigrant Tenement Museum uh, on Orchard Street um, in Southern Manhattan. And the people who run that museum also developed a neighborhood walking tour, um, which really taught me about the value of getting out, walking, looking, listening, smelling, all the things that we can learn by being, um, which is part of the pedagogy we're thinking about for elementary school kids, that, that they have to be out of the classroom, out of the building uh, to learn some of what we hope that they will learn. So I do these walking tours about immigrant history in St. Paul. Um, and um, I don't know, Helen, how am I doing on time? You're muted. Oop. Well, you have four minutes, Peter. Four minutes, very good. It's up to you whether you want to take any questions or whether you just- Great, why don't I stop there and, and see if if anyone would, would wanna ask a question, make a comment. Good idea. Thank you so much. That was oh, thank you. Fascinating. I'm so interested to hear about these curriculum development projects. I think that's wonderful. and. I already know, having been into schools in St. Paul, I know about some of the great work that's being done there, but these sound wonderful initiatives as well. Mm. So yeah, thank you so much. Really fascinating yeah. to hear. We have a question. One question in the chat was about the books that you get, the books with the um, margin notes. So yes. do, do you have secondhand booksellers looking out for them for you, or do you have other sources? Do these books come from other academics or, or where do you get them from? So the, the books are coming from uh, retiring academics, uh, the children of academics who have passed away. Um, my favorite collection, we, we have a collection that was given to us um, by a remarkable Chinese American jazz musician and political activist uh, named Fred Ho. Uh, Fred was dying of colon cancer just as we were starting the library. Uh, and he shipped us his books. Uh, they are amazing, an amazing collection um, and heavily, heavily uh, full of marginal, marginalia. We've actually had two graduate students over the years um, who were doing research on Fred and they came and, um, and as you all know, you know, we live in this era now where everyone has a smartphone and you can take pictures of everything. And, and they were taking pictures of the marginalia in Fred's books, which became part of their PhD dissertations. And the old academic that I am, I said that they were turning secondary sources into primary sources uh, in the ways that they were using them. So um, that's, you know, we're, I still buy books, uh, but they then tend to be new. Uh, and, and I'm adding them to the collections. Um, but, but most of, and I like to say that with the books has come spirit. And I feel like the spirits of many of the people who have given us books. Uh, Tony Randolph, who was an African-American lesbian journalist at Minnesota Public Radio. Um, after she passed away, her brothers gave us her books. Uh, Hi Berman, who was a historian of Jewish immigrant labor experiences and Minnesota farmer laborism. Hi's kids gave us his books after he passed away. Um, my friend Paula Rabinowitz, who taught 
uh, feminist literature at the University of Minnesota when she downsized, uh, gave, us, gave us her books. So um, the books bring a lot uh, into the space and a, and a lot of meaning uh, for us. Um, Beth and I will often say when we're confronted with what seems like a questionable opportunity, like some bank that wants to give us money and we're not sure we wanna be associated with them, we say, well, what would Fred have said? Say, so Fred would have told them to go fuck themselves. Uh, and so we, we take that to heart um, in critical moments of which path should we follow. Is there perhaps another question? Well, I just want to add that we need to finish off this very short yes. answer, but for people who haven't been lucky enough to visit the library, is it open most of the time? If people were in St. Paul, would they be able to turn up and come into the library? Yeah, we're, we're still asking in the pandemic that people make an appointment. Um, we're there a lot. Uh, and we ask people still to wear masks. We do as well. Um, we would love to see you. Um, when you visit the website, um, and, and I think in the header about us um, uh, or about, um, there is actually a 3D tour uh, of the library that some friends put together. Um, so you can get a bit of the experience of what the space is like. Um, we do like to tell people that as a so-called Carnegie Library, um, that this is a building that was paid for uh, by the exploited labor of immigrant iron miners, coal miners, and steel workers who made Andrew Carnegie the richest man in America in the early 20th century and enabled him to become a so-called philanthropist. So we, we like to make those points right up front um, so people understand what we're about. Absolutely. And... Oh, Marcelo's just saying, would you like to have a signed and dedicated copy of his book, which is called The Joy of Not Knowing? I have a copy here. Wonderful. I Yes, ideas. absolutely. Um, you can find our mailing address on the website. Um, all of you out there, if you've written books and would like to send us one, we would love to have them. And I would also say, if you've written something recently that you'd really like to call attention to, reach out to me and we can plan one of these conversations with an author. And I can find some pretty interesting local people um, to read your book and engage with you um, about it. That's a wonderful offer. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you, Marcelo, for that.